Hi, my name is Lucas, and I'm going to be moderating the discussion. It's the final discussion of the free flows um, that organize this year's exhibition. Uh, the migration flow, although it's mostly about disturbances of the flows and possible traps, blockades, and the barriers of the uh, migrants flow. Uh, so, um, just to give you a short introduction of what we're going to discuss today, I was thinking about an image that would suggest the directions and the one that I came up with is an image uh, of outside from the, of the artistic world. It's the image of a white truck on the outskirts of, of uh, Vienna, an image from 2015. Uh, an image of a, if I remember correctly, a truck with Hungarian plates uh, that was supposed to be moving uh, Slovakian meat through the borders of Europe and was suddenly found on the outskirts of Vienna. And this is an image that you can, that can be easily overlooked. And this was a horrible image and a horrible scene because inside of this refrigerating truck uh, there, there were found about 50 bodies of uh, France, uh, they already were decomposing in the summer of 2015. And the reason why I mentioned this image, one, one of the reasons is obvious. Uh, the general frame of the discussion about the so-called migrant crisis, crisis migration, and I'm using this term conscious of uh, of the kind of narrative and points of view it establishes uh, in quotation marks in a way. Uh, general frame is that the flow of uh, commodities, the flow of images is today maybe probably much easier and much uh, fluent, not disturbed and disturbed in the flow of people, at least certain people, people with certain visas, passports, etc. Uh, the other reason uh, is that this image was easily overlooked because it didn't fit into the schema of, I don't know, uh, consumption of tragedy, consumption of uh, uh, extreme situations, etc., etc. And in a way, although this is an image from from outside of the art world, what the works and artists that are here today in the section of migration, although there is so many flows between the sections, etc., etc., uh, it's, it's, it's of course unfair to say that this work is about, work is about migration, that one is about uh, nature flows, as you will see today. And this, this works, in my opinion, try to do a similar a similar thing to what this picture might have done, uh, which is search for alternative, different ways, modes, narratives, visual narratives, sometimes architectural narratives, uh, of showing what cannot be seen literally, mm. And they are very effective in that. Mm, and we're going to discuss the conditions of possibility of being effective in showing something what's uh, really not, not so easy to show. None of the artists and none of the war works that we can see in like five places, four places, the, uh, trusts anymore in the uh, in the power of visibility, in the power of literal visibility, in the power in, or in the agency that can be gained by just being shown or anything like that. They are not, they are, no one is naive anymore uh, in, this, in this terms, in terms of 
visibility. And um, to finish it, where the discussion is taking place in Poland, where the relation, very long relationship between images and migrants, a relationship that in art can be traced, I don't know, from uh, Jonas Mekas movies to, uh, to Philip Schaeffer's uh, 2016 work or something like that. Uh, this relationship in Poland is a special one because of the so called current crisis of migration is mainly present in Poland in the form of images, in the form of pictures. Like, we, because of the policy of the government, we don't actually meet that many people who are part of this crisis of migration. We, the images are the media of creating fear, uh, of creating anxiety, of exclusion in Poland. And that's why it's so important to show uh, and to discuss different modes of visualizing, different kinds of images that mm, can, be, no, can, can fight the mainstream imagery that's connected to that. Okay, and now, <laughs> that's the intro, <laughs> and yeah, I have a plan. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now I need to introduce, <laughs> introduce uh, Iris Sikin, whom, whom you know, you know from previous discussions, from discussions on the uh, exhibitions, etc., etc. I hope you can meet and talk to. Uh, and Iris is gonna introduce all the artists that, that are gonna talk about migration and their own works. And I have to introduce Inga Hajnarovic, yes. sociologist, researcher, and activist, uh, working both an, as an activist and as a scholar academic with uh, migrants, migration, etc. And Inga will uh, introduce the whole topic uh, with, with us. And uh, okay, and now uh, I'm starting with Gibbs. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I mean, it's really a reason why I do these kind of things that I have people from, you know, that are really into the topic, uh, in this case, migration, and to bring them together with artists. Um, there's a short, uh, a small change of plans because for now I just want to give names to the faces, people that are sitting here, and then when we go into discussion, I we will ask everyone to briefly introduce the project because you are the best ones to do that. So, uh, from the start, we have Oliver Sieber and Katja Stuke. Their project, You and Me, is, uh, is on show at the Bankier Gallery. Then we have Sander Breuren and Witte van Hulsen. Their uh, project, um, The Shores of an Island, uh, I only skirted, oh, sorry, it's <laughs> early morning, uh, is on show in Donder Burski. Maybe you've seen that already this morning. Then we have Anaïs Lopez. Her project is in the Festival Center. It's called The Migrant. It's an interactive project, and we'll talk about it later, I'm sure. Then is Daniela Friedel. Her project is on show in the Ethnographic Museum here. You really have to talk in his mic, I guess. Uh, Lukas Skapski, his project is next to Daniela Friedel's work in the Ethnographic Museum. In, uh, then we have Armand Quach, uh, his work is in the Bankier uh, Museum as well. And by the way, he has to leave in about like 20 minutes. Okay, good. So, he will suddenly just go. Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you for having me here, and you see uh, what kind of uh, challenging and impossible task I have. As Wukash said, I'm supposed to introduce the whole topic, and Iris before um, asked me to give some historical and sociological perspective on migration, and Sorry. maybe because you know, both artists and, as I can see, the audience represent, you know, different countries and different contexts. Maybe it would be great if I can give also some Polish context. So, um, I don't even know where to start. Um, I hope to give you a bit more information throughout the discussion. But maybe let's just throw some elements. I cannot give you any holistic perspective on migration, so I will just point out some of the elements that I found in this project that are imp important for my work and interesting for me. So, uh, I, as Wukash said, I'm a sociologist, I work as a researcher, but I'm also a teacher and a trainer. 
and I often do workshop on migration. And each workshop I start with a very short exercise that we cannot do here, of course, but I ask people to think about one family member with a history of migration, and I'm asking participants to tell me the name of this person, the relation, where did this person go, and why. Why do I do this? First, because it makes the whole discussion more personal. Uh, it's completely different to discuss if we have uh, Aunt Eva who moved to Canada because she fell in love, or, you know, like a grandma who ran because of the war. Second, it makes this distinction between migrants and refugees very blurry, because we see that these reasons for migrations are very different. You know, it's very difficult to, to judge what kind of factors are more important, what kind of factors are less important. Uh, and uh, the main reason is that it shows that the migration is not a new phenomenon, phenomenon and it, hasn't, it didn't start in 2015 with so-called refugee crisis. And although it's, you know, it, it seems obvious, but I think especially if we look at media, it's not that obvious. And I think it's important to remind people about this uh, constantly. So, um, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that migration is a universal phenomenon, it's just changing the intensity and direction. Uh, Europe traditionally used to be a continent that people wanted to be. They were going to South America, they were going to North America, they were going to Australia and all possible countries. So what strikes us now, it's not necessarily the intensity of migration, but the direction of migration. People are coming to Europe, not from Europe. And of course, the main reason why I'm doing this exercise is to show to Polish people one of the, for me, fundamentals of solidarity is that we as a nation, group, society, however you want to call it, uh, we have history of migration and all our families have this history. Sometimes people ask me if I'm not afraid of doing this exercise because what if someone doesn't have this experience? It never happened. Like we all have, uh, you know, Polish people, uh, when Poland as a country didn't exist for 100 years, uh, people migrated because of political reasons, for economic reasons. For those of you who are not from Krakow, there is this huge statue on the main square of Adam Mickiewicz, the main, most important Polish writer that we had to learn by heart when we were in high school. No one knows that half of his life he lived in Paris as a political migrant uh, who was, you know, like fighting for Polish independence. And uh, no one knows that most of the things that we need to learn by heart were produced and written actually in France. So we have this 130 years of migration. Then we have, of course, war-related migration. Then we had economic migration on all possible types. And then we have communist times when people were migrating, <clears throat> I still think mostly because of economic reasons. Although uh, communist times is an argument very often um, that I'm trying to use to discuss migration with people who are against refugees. But then they would, I, I'm telling them, hey, but Polish people, they've been migrating for the last 50 years. Yeah, but we had communist times, they had, they had a reason, they were not economic migrants. But actually, they, most of Polish people migrated because of economic reasons, or they were looking for better life, better education, better chances for themselves which for me as an activist as, and as a sociologist is a good reason to migrate as any other. Uh, so the last thing I want to mention is that um, in, in the public discourse you could see that um, there are no refugees in Poland, there are no asylum seekers, there, there are no migrants. Uh, it's all obviously not true. Uh, refugees have been coming to Poland uh, since beginning of 90s. And, of course, before there were many other types of migrants as well. Um, every year we have, on average, 10,000 asylum applications. Uh, but they are not that visible because of a few reasons. First, they don't come from the Middle East, because Middle East is not really the only region when the, we have conflicts. Uh, they mostly come from Tajikistan, from post-Soviet countries, from Chechnya, so they come from the East. Um, and what is interesting is that Poland is a country with one of the lowest rates of asylum uh, acceptance, of the acceptance of asylum application. So uh, in 2017, I think in 2016, there were almost 13,000 applications and only 108 
uh, people got refugee status. The rest are rejected. It's basically the same every year. Uh, last year we had less asylum application. Uh, why? What, what do you think we can do not to accept refugees in the country? Like we, Poland is uh, ob obliged by European Union and international law to accept asylum seeker application when this person crossed the border, the person says asylum, and the person has a right to apply for asylum status. So what is the easiest way not to let them apply? You don't let them in into a country. So for the past two years, you had thousands and thousands of asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, occupying our eastern border, which is also an eastern border of European Union, with full encouragement and acceptance of European Union. Only in 2016, in the first six months of 2016, 42,000 people, from, mostly from Tajikistan at the time, were refused and they couldn't enter uh, the borders of European Union. They were just stuck on the border, of many, of them, many of them for, for many, many months. And uh, last uh, thing about related to Polish migration, and I think to the issue that will be discussed more throughout this discussion, is the issue of the representation. So it's not only the direction of the migration that changes, but also the groups that we perceive as privileged or less privileged, or as a good migrant and a bad migrant. And I just want to remind you about something that uh, it's actually a new topic for me, introduced by Paulina Napierawa, the professor from Jagiellonian University. She introduced me to the topic of the perception of Polish migrants in the United States in 19th century and beginning of 20th century. So actually, the Polish migrants were perceived as uneducated, and they were perceived as a threat. A threat for uh, social order, the threat for children, women, and society, because they were uneducated, and they were religious fanatics, because they were Catholic. So comparing to Protestants in the US, they were considered as fanatics, that people were afraid of them. Uh, I want to finish now with this, because I think you can easily connect this image, this representation, with how Muslims are represented, especially in media nowadays in Europe. Thanks so much. Uh, so I think, of course, the issue, the issue of representation and perception will be in the center of our discussion, discussion for the whole time. Uh, but let's start with our mom and, uh, because of the organizational issues, but also because of the fact that his work connects uh, the main topics or points on our roadmap or the roadmap of this discussion and the plan is not intended here. The issue of roots uh, and reconstructions of the journey that's going to start from the issue of landscape and the uh, strange situation or being a part of a landscape, going through a landscape, etc. etc. Finally, the architecture of oppression uh, that, 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 uh, that stops the flows or moves them uh, somewhere in the other direction, etc., making their journey more difficult and dangerous. But we'll start with uh, Armand with a question to introduce his work, but also to uh, develop on the formal language that he uses in his in, in his journey and about the history of the work because it started as a work about a uh, refugee crisis it then shifted into a, a conceptual work about the crisis in Europe etc. Um, yeah, the link to the migration crisis um, but it's a, a different migration crisis than we, we had the actual one starting in 2015 it was the the, um, the migration coming mostly from Africa up to Lampedusa. Um, I was in Lampedusa in 2008, and uh, it was uh, one of the early points of the work where I wanted to confront myself to um, European issues. My topic was the European landscape, European identity. Uh, and so for me, living at the time in Brussels, it was for me an interesting journey to connect Brussels to Lampedusa and drive down over six weeks then to Lampedusa to, to be able to see myself what is happening there and how it looks um, 
this mostly in reflection what what is the role of an artist how, how do you um, position yourself in society and what is the role uh, that you can play um, the difficult turn in presenting my work is uh, as you see the picture here it's um, uh, like a Leica photography um, but it's not real it's in um, the tourist office in Italy in Rimini so it's more about the, the, the main topic of the work is photography, in, in, the, in essence. Um, but based on uh, the questioning, what is European identity? How is the, the, the identity constructed over history, and mainly the history, the recent history, from the two world wars up to, to, the, to the day with the migrant crisis and the financial crisis, which was already happening Back then, when I was photographing the work, so I have been to Athens and the Balkans. And, um, yeah, now how to get this um, wrapped into one <laughs> migration topic? Um, I think the, 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 the initial starting point was really to think about and going to see by myself uh, what is happening in Europe at one moment. So I was in Lampedusa in 2008, it was quite early. Um, the migration topic was not as present as it is today. It was really present because of a lot of people died in the sea, uh, just in front of Lampedusa, because of, as well, people would not be get accepted, so they were rejected and brought back to Libya or Tunisia, uh, or just not taken care of, and so they drowned. And, Nobody talked about it. And the central piece in the exhibition on the floor is the Lampedusan Sea. Um, perhaps, why is it on the floor and why is it so big? For me, it was interesting to see how people uh, take a moral standpoint. You can walk over it. We are able in this exhibition to just cross this sea without any problem. But it's um, a huge barrier for a lot of people with um, mostly economic aspirations because they want to have a better life. This is, uh, I think, the, the best reason to move <laughs> because you can have a better life somewhere else. So it's, uh, I think, uh, justified to try <laughs> to go somewhere else because we all did. As you said, in your family, you will probably find the person that uh, did, did travel to, to find a better life somewhere else, perhaps in a country or <coughs> in Europe or all over the world. Um, my work is um, then based really on landscape, photographing landscape. I followed a lot of um, uh, borders in Europe, um, natural borders, mountains, the Alps uh, is one of the important pictures in it. Uh, I, I traveled through the Balkans, through Albania to Athens, um, that became the Balkan route later on. Um, at the time when I was doing, driving down there, the, it wasn't named like this. It wasn't really a topic at the time then. Um, <coughs> my interest was more the, because it was the last war at the time that uh, you had seen. And I think we try, we tend to forget sometimes that it's in, really in the middle of Europe, uh, because it's like a, a white spot on the map. Uh, when you look at the map from Europe, the European Union, the Balkans and Albania, they literally don't exist. Often Albania is just a white spot, there are no roads, nothing. So it's, it, this, some, this intrigued me that I had to see. Uh, again, to see by myself as an artist, a photographer, dealing with reality by the medium he uses to confront myself with a situation. To be able, not to report, but to, to document something, to, to, to tell a story about it. But to to position myself in this historic context or political context at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, one, one question for you about the sea, because we talked about it yesterday. I was uh, a couple of weeks ago. I did a tour in the Bakir Museum for uh, students, and uh, well, we were going through the exhibition, and yet, and then uh, I. Uh, Center. <laughs> Sorry. And um, and then one of the girls, one of the students, was going to lie down in the sea, and I was a bit shocked. But that was my position then. 
And then I saw later on, on, the, on the Facebook page that on the opening that people also were lying down in the sea. What do you think of it? Can you tell, tell us a bit about it? Um, for me, it's really an interesting uh, way how people deal with these images um, because I don't use captions. I don't tell people when they come into the show, this is the Lampedusa Sea, this is where thousands of people drowned. So for me, it's interesting to see how people deal with these images, how they appropriate themselves these kind of things because for somebody who is not informed, it's just a grey surface and representing water. They don't know, necessarily know the implications or the, the, the impetus that was given to me to, to produce this image was my reflection about it. So for me it's interesting to see how people react to it and what they do with it. Yeah. So for me it's quite legit to, if they want to swim in the sea, they can, <laughs> they, 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 and they do. So this is, yeah. this for me is a good thing uh, to see that people react differently <coughs> to, to, to images because the image used to be a medium mm -hmm. of truth um, but I think it's mostly become an, an, a medium of um, manipulation. Um, that's also why all the, the images I use and I produce it with um, um, publicity uh, media, like the, the Lampedusa Sea is a, a vinyl uh, that you hang normally on, on large screens for publicity, for L'Oréal or whatever. The, the wooden boards, this is um, uh, as well a technique used mostly for um, producing the publicity for consumption. So it's um, but this is again this is the, the, the level where you come to the media and critic where you yeah. yeah. Great. And you 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 already mentioned uh, um, the idea of well it's first uh, a short comment like these people lying on the floor of your work being a part of the work in 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 a way fulfill the narrative. That it's it's a work about Europe and European crisis, and not about not only about the refugee crisis or the refugee crisis through the European crisis or, or, or something like that. You, you mentioned you mentioned the roots and the, that were created later, earlier, that are invisible, and uh, to introduce this uh, topic, the topic of the journey, journey that is uh, complicated, and that for us. Uh, for most of us, maybe for all of us, we can see all the fragments of this journey. And uh, these, these are paradox paradoxical fragments because we usually see the refugees uh, in the camps stopped. And the, the essence uh, of their situation is being on the move, not being at home, being somewhere else, going somewhere. Like, sometimes being on the run, sometimes uh, making a journey. And, in the mainstream media, we usually see them stopped. We see them uh, in the camps. We see them in front of walls, etc., etc., which, which radically changes our perception of what's going on here and what's their what's their status. Uh, and to to open the subject of groups, I would like to ask uh, Katia and Oliver to. Tell us about their work, but maybe first uh, I'll ask uh, Inge uh, to tell us something about the changes on the map of uh, routes of travels, escapes, etc. etc. I would try to be brief because I'm sure you have uh, more interesting things to say. Yeah, I, think, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that you know, discussion about routes, it's like an ongoing discussion in sociology and in social science, like between agency and structure, you know, whether like we are determined by some structures or we have agency and freedom to create different things. And it's a bit like this with, with the routes, because what we could see in, in 2015, when people were really allowed to walk through Europe, um, we were saying at certain point that, you know, this is like the, the agency of people won. They really have a power to, to destroy Dublin free regulation, yeah, which uh, forced refugees to stay in the first country of European Union. And this is like, this is a real, uh, you know, this is a real example of power of the people. Um, that activists for 10 years were unable to uh, destroy Dublin free and refugees 
did it. Uh, I think it's partially true, and I like this narrative because it gives the agency back to migrants who are doing really very difficult thing when they migrate to Europe and they walk weeks. Uh, but we need to remember that there are usually political decisions that uh, actually create routes. And uh, as you mentioned, that the Western uh, Balkan route wasn't there. And it was always there, but we didn't talk about this because there were only a few people coming. Then you had Eastern Balkan route, Central Mediterranean, Western Mediterranean, other Mediterranean routes. And we can see that they are being closed by political decisions. So in 2016, we had Turkey EU deal that was supposed to close migration from Turkey uh, to Greece. It actually didn't. I met activists from Lesbos yesterday, and they told me that there is 300 people arriving daily. So it's like it's significant number of people. Again, we had route through Lampedusa and through Italy that actually being stopped um, because Italy uh, has a deal with uh, with Libya, as most of you know. Uh, and they are paying them to stop people in Libya right now. I don't know if you know that uh, right now Italy is sending their own NGOs to Libya uh, to organize refugee camps there so people don't leave. So they, we don't only export the borders, we export also the camps. Um, and we have a border through Morocco that is also the deal that many people don't know about because Morocco is not letting people into Europe because Spain and European Union is allowing Morocco to occupy Western Sahara. So it's also a very important political deal. Uh, one thing about the routes, um, the routes e were easier in 2015 because there were many advantages of many people migrating together. And we could see in 2015, 2016, that those routes that were not that crowded, for example, route through uh, Bulgaria, were the most dangerous. And these were the people, they could not protect themselves. So this is the route where most people died, apart from the sea, and were tortured, for example, by guards, military, and police. There were many people tortured in Bulgaria in the past few years. Um, and um, the last thing about... Um, uh, about what you mentioned, Lukasz, that we see only people that are uh, who are stopped. Uh, I'm I actually doing my research now in Lebanon because of the reasons. I work for three years in Europe, and I realized that me and other activists, researchers that were working in Greece, we perceive people as they teleported themselves to Turkish coast, and then they go in this small dinghy to a Greek island, and then they go by a ferry to Greek continent. We completely forget about what was happening with them before. So we ignore few months or few lives, few years of their lives, when they were either internally displaced in their own country, or they stay in the neighboring country. So if we talk about kids, it's not few months without schools. It's a few years in Lebanon or Turkey, for example. That's good. The, the previous history actually doesn't exist in our mainstream view of the the situation. There's no reason they just suddenly pop up from the sea, and that's what we that's what we uh, discovered. Uh, coming back to finally to Katia and Oliver, you decided to uh, work with a narrative of a very very long journey and to create this nar uh, narrative of many many fragments of found through your quasi investigative work uh, and. The fragments from the other works of art, music, literature, etc., etc. Can you describe your decision and, and the work itself? Yeah, the, um, we started this work, I think, in 2013, and the question wasn't like dealing with migration, the question was like, what happened to Indira? And Indira was a woman we knew in the 90s. She came uh, from Bosnia, which was like in Germany, that was a big thing because there were almost 200,000 200, people coming from Bosnia to Germany, and at that time there was a lot of like political history and uh, historic things and right wing people coming up. And so in Germany it was a, uh, a political thing, but for us at that time we finished our art, art school classes and we heard about it in the, in the news, but it didn't affect our life in a way. So we tried to understand what was going on, but um, 
Uh, we had our first like personal contact with this mob too, Indira. She came to Düsseldorf. Um, she was a friend of Oliver's mother, and she helped us a little bit in our studio, cleaning and um, organizing in a way. And uh, but we didn't communicate in a way because she didn't speak German or English, and we didn't speak Bosnian. So in a way, we knew each other, but we didn't know anything about each other. And that 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 time so many other things happened in our lives. So it was like some friends killed themselves and there was like what do we do with our lives in, after we finished, finished school and uh, what kind of artists will we be. So there were all these other questions which always happen at the same time. So there's a war in, in a country but in your life you also you go to the movies, you listen to music, you're a fan of, of musicians. So that's everything is happening at the same time. And uh, when we came to Chicago in 2013, there's a big Bosnian community. That was the point when we asked ourselves, like, where is Indira? And what happened to her? And uh, there was the Museum of Photography and the Goethe uh, Institute. They thought this is an interesting question because we could connect like, our life with Indira's life and we could connect the, the countries, the Bosnia, Bosnia, Germany, and the US. And so uh, we traveled and we didn't know where Indira was. So that was, uh, we knew she's somewhere in America. And we heard that she's somewhere maybe in uh, Connecticut? No, uh, in Bowling Green? Yeah. <laughs> Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah. And uh, so we went to Sarajevo and we went to Tuzla and we went to um, uh, Zvornik. But that was only because we didn't have any facts, but we said, like, let's go there. Maybe Indira came from Zvornik, and we read something in the news about a Bosnian refugee, uh, uh, Frankie, who is now like a big hip hop star in, in Bosnia. And he was a refugee also in, in Nuremberg in Germany. And uh, when we arrived in Sarajevo, there were some protests. And at, I think at that moment, we decided to be like super open to everything we see on the uh, during our travels, so not focusing on Indira's story, not trying to explain or tell Indira's story, but to be open what's also connected now through our travel. And so there were protests and um, the, uh, we met like other musicians in, in America and then we, for example, went to uh, Tampa and met this like woman uh, on a cosplay convention and uh, there were less, like religious protests against these kind of people so that was our approach like being open meeting other people connecting uh, Indira's story which for us is a question of maybe human rights and then in America we crossed the, the, the path of the civil rights movement so in a way we, through our travel and our interests we created the story based on Indira's life the, the sense that uh, I, I get from your work is that the, the travel or being on the road for a migrant person never ends. Like if you're, you're just going from one place to another, from uh, Zvornik to Düsseldorf, from Düsseldorf to one city in the US where she used to have you know, a restaurant, if I remember correctly, then to another. And you're chasing her and she's running away or something. Anyway, and there are always these different reasons because in, she left Zvornik because that's in our understanding where the, the war started. And uh, in 1999 there was the deal, Germany said like when the war is over you have to go back to, to your um, home country. And they said no, we can't go back because Zvornik is now in the Republika Srpska and we are Muslim people. so. We can't just go back, it's not our home anymore. So they got a chance, I think at that point, um, Clinton and uh, uh, made a deal and they let a lot of like, refugees into the US. So they got a green card and so that was the second reason. That was like, the first was like maybe their personal life. The second one was the politician, yeah. political decision. And then they opened this restaurant, you and me in, in Bowling Green and then she got sick and she got cancer, cancer because of the I don't know what she was doing there, so that was a third reason. That was a, a economic, but also like a personal reason dealing with her uh, uh, life. And now at the end, they are in uh, Saint Petersburg, in Florida, and that's why where we found her. And um, and it was uh, yeah interesting to see her, to talk to her for the first time in English, 
but then to also figure out that we are not we have nothing in common in a way so we have totally different interests like we found like super nice shops in st petersburg or we found a nice record store and we, but that's not part of her life so if we would meet her now in st petersburg we would have nothing in common in a way but it was nice because there's this personal connection to oliver's mother so in a way we're kind of family now and maybe that's in a family you also you don't have to have a, a lot of things in common with your cousin they are just there because you are family i have a, a <coughs> does it work <coughs> yes yes it works yes uh, one question to you, um, because we are presenting the work as a video installation, a two-channel video installation, and as a book at the table, and from the book we took out the research materials. Can you maybe elaborate a bit on the, um, on the why, what is the motivation for making a video installation next to the book, or the other way around? <laughs> I, I'm not sure what was first. <laughs> Yeah, I think at the beginning, because we made it in collaboration with the museum in Chicago, we knew we had a space and we knew we wanted to show pictures on the wall and we wanted to make a book. And so the book was, in a way, there from the very beginning and for us it was uh, interesting to see because we made all these different kind of photographs and we uh, had different approaches how to deal with the images. And Oliver made an installation for the wall, and, which was more associated associative and uh, emotional maybe and I wanted to have some structure so I was interested in doing the book and uh, and um, for this place we th we, um, uh, uh, we did developed the, the first presentation we made because we had like I think 190 photographs on the, on the wall like small images and we had a monitor with text, with the quotes, and we had this idea that the people look at the images and then look at the text and combine the text and the, the image. But uh, we thought maybe it's stronger to uh, fix like the quotes to certain images and develop a, a continuous um, yeah. juxtaposition of text and image. So that was for us it's at the moment a very perfect form to combine all these different layers and all these different things happening at the same time and connecting the, the, the word and the uh, uh, photograph. Thank you. Thank you. To all the artists that are wait, waiting with, to the uh, public, so this format of the discussion is not easy. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. <laughs> So I'm moving to uh, Anais to ask about her investigation um, and this quasi fable, quasi uh, documentary, nature documentary, an amazing piece that you can see in the Festival Bureau. So yeah, it's a quite surprise to have to tell. <laughs> Um, where to start? Uh, I started to make a story about a bird. Uh, it's called the Derva Maina. I started five years ago to investigate his life. And as a storyteller, I always use a little story to tell a bigger story about the society we live in. So I used this bird to tell the story about the migration. And I used this story to tell also how we deal with uh, foreigners, but also how we deal with building society and what we can afford to do that, and which rules we can apply to it. So I met this little bird you see here, and it's called Maina, he became my friend five years ago, and for five years we uh, walked together and I investigated his life. And I found out he was a songbird, and that he was really famous for his songs, and that he could imitate human speech, and then suddenly people started to hate him. And now these days he is uh, public number one enemy of Singapore, He's unwanted and he's, uh, people are going after him and they try to kill him and to cast him and to do horrible things with him. And um, then when I encountered this bird, I really felt there was this story where we were going through ourselves in our society. And even if he lives in Singapore, it's where we are now dealing with migration. 
and his story is a real story, and it learns, for me, it learns what happened in the past and what we're doing now, and it reflects on society. Thanks for short wrapping up of a really complicated and long video video work. And uh, what 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 seems uh, really important to me in this work, apart from the formal aspect of it, uh, maybe uh, a little I, a little bit ironic sense of working with a bird and its history, etc., etc., uh, is the fact of paying attention to. Uh, things like voice, because uh, of course this discussion, the photo map is about visuality, visualizing images, etc., etc. But actually, voice, sound, uh, 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 and this sphere is also an important sphere of creating a difference and creating uh, the other, the ones who should be excluded from the from the society, the bird. And actually, the bird, uh, if I understand correctly is so loud because it was moved to the city and in the reaction to the uh, to the sounds of the city it changed his his first way of expressing so that's that, 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 that's the really amazing part because uh, the, the difference is always created in this artificial arbitrary way and in the, and without a sense of reasons why someone is uh, acting the way the way it is and with this part it's really st striking the, 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 the voice as a distinguishing feature that forces the exclusion uh, and we're moving we're moving very fast and then you're gonna have a chance to ask questions uh, we're moving towards uh, that's the same road we're moving towards landscapes we're moving towards landscapes uh, <coughs> Uh, a traditional uh, genre of visual representation, the one that was supposed to be uh, out of fashion, artificial today, etc., etc., but that now serves uh, artistic practices to uh, reflect on the issues of visibility and invisibility. And I'm going to start with a question to. In a, with a question uh, to Sander and Vita about uh, about their work that you can see just close by in the uh, Domnum in uh, first to introduce the work the, the work to us and then to explain the the, the, the notion of a guilty landscape uh, and the notion of the memory of the landscape because that seems really really interesting. Um, yeah, maybe I don't know if everybody saw it, so I'll uh, explain a little bit uh, what it is. And uh, it's um, uh, this is a still from uh, uh, the video. It's a video installation. It's actually a screen that is uh, suspended in the middle of the room, and there is projections from two sides. So it's like a, you know, like a sculpture also. And um, this is from the front side of of the video. And the front side is uh, 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 recordings that we made ourselves on uh, Utrea. It's the island in uh, Norway where uh, in 2011 Anders Breivik uh, killed a whole uh, number of socialist uh, uh, youth uh, members of the socialist party that were there on the youth camp. And um, it was for him, uh, yeah, let's say a protest or, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, he was really uh, concerned about uh, uh, immigration also and about the policies of the uh, socialist and he was from a kind of very extreme right-wing uh, ideology and uh, so then on the front uh, screen of, of the installation you see uh, images of this island that kind of uh, traveled through the day so uh, that, yeah, it kind of goes from uh, morning recordings in the morning uh, like this to uh, in the dark at night, and uh, there uh, it's the we filmed it about a year and a half after uh, the attacks, and um, the island is uh, yeah let's say overgrown by nature in a way. Like the uh, normally, of course, it's quite well maintained. It's like a camping site, but um, yeah, this during this year and a half, uh, the kind of nature took back or took over this uh, place and. 
Yes, and that's on the front side, and then on the back side of the screen, there are images that we uh, found online, so it's like a collage of uh, found footage. And they, um, with this uh, footage, we constructed a, a journey, a sea journey, and there are images of, uh, uh, of the sea, of, but also images that migrants uh, usually show themselves, or in some cases, uh, some uh, footage from news and things like this, so you see a journey of uh, people on boats on the sea, so there's on the one side a place or a space, and on the other side there's a journey or a movement, and both these sides of the screen are, are uh, connected through uh, the sound, which is the same for both. Mm. Yeah, to come back to your notion of this guilty landscape, which is actually also a bit something that we, in a way, struggle with. I, it is in a way, yeah, you can really wonder, of course, about um, if something, yeah, if, um, of course, it is in a way a place that is, uh, yeah, extremely loaded and that is uh, yeah, where these horrible events happen. But on the other hand, I also really like this, uh, once we were thinking about it, like how, um, how is this landscape now loaded, you also realize it's, of course, also only our own uh, memory. And there is also something nice in the thought that uh, I read in a poem of Pessoa at the time that he writes that a stone is actually just a stone. And that there is, on the one hand, for me, something cruel in this idea that this nature actually remembers absolutely nothing of this. And there's, at the same time, it can also be comforting that actually it's also an event that happens uh, that uh, the world also exists afterwards. And the landscape is a genre that is very phenomenal, that is very, very problematic in terms of uh, distance and creating a distance. You can ask when you, when you ask about the definition of a landscape, uh, it's a representation of a view. You cannot inhabit a landscape. Like for you, when you find yourself in a landscape, is is because you should be watching and not trying to survive. And uh, maybe that's why the. Uh, landscape wor works of art uh, linked to the refugee crisis are so strong or so uh, so 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 meaningful. And to um, go, uh, to, 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 to 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 continue the subject of landscape, but now with uh, features that are found with the landscape, we'll go to uh, to the works of Daniela and then Lukas. Uh, Monument cemetery and the birds. So we're going, we're going back to uh, the representation of certain flows via the representation of other um, phenomena like swarms of swarms of birds. So, um, I, f um, I found very interesting that uh, most of the things that you said about your work, uh, I uh, feel also apply to my work. I, I uh, work with the same kind of bird. It's also a starling, the miners a starling. And uh, it's also, it's a, a European migrant bird that um, <coughs> in the winter travels to, or used to travel to Africa. Uh, but now with all the um, climate change and difference in uh, uh, agriculture and so on it uh, just goes to or one of one of them uh, some of them go to Rome and uh, they have the um, <coughs> uh, they have the correct characteristics that they um, sleep in large uh, communal roosts and uh, so at, at each night at sunset um, hundred thousands or close to a million starlings descend on the um, Roman cemetery and uh, sleep there. It's a it's a, it's a massive spectacle and uh, it's uh, it's it's a very two sided face of a of a, of a metal. It's uh, on one hand it's a it's a it's a over it's a breathtaking spectacle of nature and at the same time it's uh, it's it's a health and safety cat catastrophe in Rome. And uh, it's of course it's a it's a it's a man-made problem. Um, um, uh, the birds feed on the on the monoculture of olives, and 
and uh, the climate has changed, so they just stay and they just um, 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 cause a huge problem in the, in the whole city. And uh, so I, I, I focused on the cemetery and um, the Romans, in order to protect themselves from these swarms, uh, started to wrap their graves in plastic to at least uh, protect themselves from, from the uh, guano. And uh, it's uh, for me, it's uh, very. So if you if you see if you if you see the birds in the sky, you you, you just realize how helpless uh, uh, or how um, um, every attempt to protect yourself against uh, uh, something like a migration like this is t totally um, uh, futile and and. Um, so it's a it's a very strong symbol for 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 uh, for migration. It's migration from north to south that I find very interesting. It's the birds from Germany, from Poland, from from Scandinavia that uh, now uh, come to Rome. It's it's um, also the works called um, I lose track of it and I wander and meander a bit. Uh, the work is called Auspicia, which uh, is an old Roman practice. Uh, reading uh, the flight of birds in the sky uh, to to get the consent uh, uh, of the gods, and um, and um, it's uh, each it's not um, one bird from left to right doesn't mean a certain thing, but it's always in the interpretation of the observer. So uh, everyone everyone <coughs> sees something else, and for 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 so. Uh, everyone has their own perspective on these things, and, and uh, so it, I hope to um, to um, put in many many threads of of thoughts with uh, different interpretations. I, I I try to const have constructed my images in a very direct and um, manner matter of fact, but at the same time very open and. Um, open to many readings, so um, kind of... Yeah, yeah. yesterday I did try to discuss if, if, if whether there is a work here that uh, not metaphorically but literally connects all the free flows and I, I have a feeling that your work can be this kind of work if we, if we add uh, this uh, was this travels uh, as a representation of metaphors or di of different travels of people, different uh, routes, etc. Then we've got the flow of nature. Then the swarm actually is uh, one of the most important metaphors of media now in the mm, uh, in the media studies or uh, algorithm studies, etc., etc. So. There, there's everything here, and uh, the way we uh, the way we change. And there's also the, the whole Anthropocene problem in just one picture, actually. Yeah. But the, the work is really, really complicated. It's not one picture. You have to you have to see it by yourself. And finally, we're, we're on the road. We we meet different kinds of uh, barriers and. Uh, and Ukash uh, Skomsky's work is about this very literal, literal wall that that you meet. The wall that uh, was supposed to disappear first after 1989. There was this uh, idea that the walls that that's the end of the the walls, etc., etc. Uh, but that was actually the beginning of a new wave of walls, uh, both in Europe and the rest of the world. And then after 9-11, there is another wave of the walls, and we're, uh, we're experiencing the, 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 the next one probably, probably now. And it's a paradoxical situation, it's a crazy situation, because uh, the idea of the whole photon flows. We know that these flows are not uh, problematic, and, Etc. Etc. But but these flows, like yesterday's discussed uh, flows, flow of data, uh, of money, capital, of commodities, etc. Etc. And suddenly, a very literal, like concrete, both in Polish and in English sense of the word, uh, uh, very physical barrier 
that, that some people face and that, uh, uh, that works on both sides of the wall, that creates our identity as people who try to block others to secure their own way of life or secure, as Wendy Brown says, and this, this idea of uh, nation-state sovereignty that doesn't exist anymore because of the yesterday's discussion, flows of capital, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg's hearing in the Congress that was discussed yesterday, that, that, that shows us the weakness of sovereign state that needs to create this kind of uh, physical performances of its power, etc., uh, etc. Et and I'll ask uh, to introduce his project, and I'll ask Inga to, 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 to comment on the on the meaning and actual agency of barriers uh, um, that, 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 that refugees meet on their way. Hello. Okay. My, my project, uh, everybody has, has seen it, is, uh, but I, to, to those who haven't uh, described, these are nine models of approximately 15 borders, fenced borders, or walled borders, which existed in 2016 in Europe. And, and uh, the, the, the first one I have, the first model of a wall, is a model of a wall constructed in 2008. And this is quite simple work, actually. There's not much to talk about, <laughs> because it's pretty informative and, you could say, educational. Um, of course, there's a, it has a history, it has inspirations, I don't know if it's interesting for you, um, but uh, what I wanted to say, that's educational. And, uh, and uh, the history is actually when I was young and I went to Berlin for the first time, I went to the uh, Museum. It was a museum of escapes through Berlin Wall and through the, the fence, because the entire East Germany was, was fenced at the time, not only that. That was the most famous border, actually, but the uh, entire Comic-Con country's, country's block was fenced. There was a very nice fence, very efficient, I mean, in Czechoslovakia, in Bulgaria, you know. They, it was so wide that there are very nice wine yards now, uh, where the fence was, the, the, the system was like 15 kilometers fence, I mean, 15 kilometers wide fence, yeah. there were two fences, and uh, <laughs> it's very nice wine from there. Too. Okay, talking about nice, nice wine, it was very nice to start this discussion practically at 11 o'clock from, from Prosecco with strawberries, nice juice for decades, Prosecco. I have to say, I don't blame anybody. I enjoyed it, but that places our discussion in a in a special context, I think, because we enjoyed our prosecco on every occasion we have, and we still we uh, maybe it's because we have the walls in the walls maybe. Uh, okay, coming back to to um, what was it, checkpoint Charlie. There I saw a model of of, uh, of a wall, a Berlin wall, and actually when I was in Hungary on my what's called residency, I decided to work on the refugee crisis, uh, and I went a lot to Serbia to refugee camps, and I found that this this objective model of, 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 uh, of new walls is very appropriate. It allows me not to say too much, but to say enough to depict the, 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 the catastrophe a European democratic, a liberal democratic system is now going through. 
Thank you very much. But why did you choose uh, the models and not, for example, photography project? Or why did you Why did you decide to build the wall? I I hadn't I didn't have budget for photography. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would have to have drones, fly over borders, it would be shut down probably. Uh, you know, it's a bit complicated. I travel all around Europe, uh, really, because it's, it's, it's a big area we are advancing. The reason why I ask is because it works, like the, the fact that this con uh, this, this, this walls are physical objects and we decided to create miniature physical object, we, uh, similar to the architectural models, which uh, makes us think about there are people who actually work on these walls. Although, as uh, Al Weizmann informed us, there was, there was almost no architects building the Israel-Palestinian wall, and there are no ar architects involved in building a huge, uh, a huge wall. But your walls, worse in, uh, walls in Europe, are actually highly developed architecture with uh, fence, wall, road, etc., etc. Yeah, but you know, the, the another reason is that uh, such um, architectural model, because I was kind of thinking to objectivize it as, as much as possible, is really about I mean, the ocean, while Everybody know, everybody here, I think, is aware of the discussion of the subjectivity of <coughs> photography, etc., etc. Now, photography for me, it was too subjective, maybe. And this is sort of more objective. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something on in this way of thinking, you know. So, short comment on that. Um, I, I think these models really show the complexity of, of these walls, and that one of the most important factors that contribute to their creation is the transfer of knowledge that is going on between these different countries that inspire themselves and exchange technology. And coming back to Israeli Palestinian wall, uh, there is a huge cooperation between uh, Israel and multiple European countries in exchanging this kind of security technologies. And it's not only about walls, it's also about detention centers. So actually, this, this cooperation, you know, different, um, probably, I'm sure artists and different social movements uh, nowadays base their activities on transfer of knowledge, uh, states and security institutions as well. Um, just, just two things as a summary that we need to remember that we have uh, we can see two processes, like one is we are building walls inside, the, uh, like around the European Union, but also we have this, I want to bring again back the externalization of the borders, that we are moving the borders um, outside the European Union to different countries, but we are also moving them into our cities, for example. And uh, you have more and more random checkups in different European countries. So the border is not, um, it's not a place where people are checked. They can be checked outside the European Union and in different cities. So the mobility, for example, of asylum seekers can be very restricted, depending on the, on the country, of course, and on the city. Just as an example, in Lebanon, it's, Lebanon hasn't signed the Geneva Convention, so people cannot apply for refugee status. Um, they can apply for residency that is very expensive. So 70% of Syrians don't have any kind of residency, which means that they cannot move out from the house because if they are stopped at the checkpoint, they will be arrested and deported to Syria. Uh, so, um, of course, it, it is a class issue. Uh, you can buy European visa, you can buy European citizenship. Uh, visas are a bit cheaper. Uh, one year ago, a uh, Belgian visa cost um, costed 6,000 euros, more or less. So uh, these prices are, are there. And, uh, and if you have enough money, you can come. So just to have in mind that it's also always a class issue. And the uh, last thing about this externalization of the borders, 
and uh, this is actually a question that came to my mind when Daniela was talking about her uh, project and that uh, before the birds were going to Africa. Um, and I was wondering whether the birds were a problem while they were in Africa, or we just don't know about this, or maybe they were dispersed and you know it wasn't a problem. But it's a bit like this with refugees, no? Until they are in the region that they are from, we don't see the problem and we keep them there and it's okay. And the majority of refugees stay in the regions that they are from. And yeah, just let's come. Thank you. Great, and now it's time to open the discussion. But before that, I'm going to ask uh, Iris to, because it's, it's a final discussion after a free, free flows discussion, to, uh, to tell us something about the connection between the flows. You knew that I will ask the question, so uh, this way, I, I, that was my last sentence, and then your questions. <laughs> okay, we can elaborate on it briefly. Okay, obviously later. Um, thank you for, for all being here. I mean, it's warm, I know, uh, but it, I think it's so important to hear uh, the artists telling about their work and to connect it to the whole, well, the whole world we are living in, in a way. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. And uh, when I started this this big uh, curatorial adventure uh, with the festival, uh, I had a kind of uh, wish list of artist projects that I really wanted to present. And um, as I'm a person that is uh, fond of mapping, and especially uh, geographical maps, I really like to map everything. I make schedules. I'm an um, Excel nerd. You know, I really like to organize and plan everything. So I had these different projects that I wanted to, that I was sure of, that I really wanted to show them, uh, or I had people in mind that I wanted to ask, "What are you working on?" So can we show that in 2018? And then, well. I tried to make categories and uh, I came into the categories that are now becoming the subject. I mean, so that's simple as it is. So it was projects about nature, projects about migration, and projects projects about um, the digital sphere, about data. Um, so I made this map. It is in my home, still my home office. and um, And there actually you can see what is behind all this. And the other map that I made, um, and that goes back to the ge geographical uh, maps that I really like, is that I had a map of the city of Krakow, because it's a city, it's a festival in a city, uh, where we have to spread all the locations. And at a certain moment, we know that we could use almost 10 locations, which is about wow. Um, so I have all your projects and all these different chapters and all these different subjects. I spread them around the city, and it's something you know that sometimes you think, okay, you should tell that. Um, uh, but I thought you know that's something behind. But now I use it to give you an answer um, because it also brought me. I mean, it was kind of, of course, a parallel thing um, because. When I had this idea of the different chapters, nature, migration, and data, I would think, well, I have to come up with something that binds it all together. And I've always been so intrigued by this notion of the space of flows, which is what now end up as the title, and what is um, what connects that to my kind of uh, interest in, in mapping things is the space of places. Um, Manuel Castells. Um, make this division in the 90s. We have the space of places where we know everything. We know uh, we know the people that live there. We know where the bakery is. We know where to go. We can find our way. And he proposed that for this new digital area, this digital square that we didn't know by then, and he called it the network society, which has a kind of invisibility in it. Um, he proposed for that the space of flows, but then on top of it, so it is it didn't come um, instead of, but it's too. We're still living here, we have our foot on the ground, we can find our way with a map. And in the space of flows, it's much more difficult. There's not really a map. And that's one of the reasons we need artists, for example, and other kind of people to guide us around. Um, and I also, of course, wanted to say something about this, this um, moment in time that we have so many images you already started with this very strong example of an image and that we see it and we see it briefly and we're not sure what can we do with it how can we position us and we have uh, many images that come from uh, from automatic cameras that are not even made by people 
that is a reference to the work of Jules Spinach in the Starmer Gallery. And in the end, and I think I can close it with, a, um, with the work that is, I think, the key work. <laughs> And I put it to the selection, it was the, the, the final one that I added to the selection, is the work of Elina Benjaminson. And uh, when I saw it for a second time in like February, I was like, wow, um, this, is, this is what it all binds together. Because her work is uh, where the money is made, it's uh, presented in Chara Gallery, and um, her, um, her short video uh, starts with a quote of Adrienne Lahoud. Adrian Lahoud is a professor at the School of Architecture in the UK, and he's working on a kind of um, interdisciplinary field of architecture, urban environment, climate change, and I want. I think it's it's good to close with that quote. So I will read it for you. And the quote is: "There is a strange sympathy between the atmospheric particles that float through the sky." and human beings who migrate across the ground and then across the sea. Each body sets the other emotion into motion, a pattern of movement and counter-movement. So what he does is connecting the, well, what is happening in the air with the aerosols, for example, the works of Susan Shupley, and what is happening on the ground with the people that walk through the landscape. And then, of course, and that is what Eline is adding, but also another project uh, presented is what is happening um, underground through the cables because that's where the data data is flowing. That's the answer. <laughs> <coughs> okay, the mic is yours. Comments, questions, disagreements, arguments. Well, I think we don't know enough. <laughs> That's good. good. It's early, it's warm, I know. <laughs> mm, I have a question to you, think, so I will let you compose your question. Uh, uh, because the media part, the media flow, the data flow, um, uh, as part of this exhibition, and as context for our discussion, uh, forces a question about the role of uh, digital media uh, in the daily routes, lives uh, of the refugees. Um, and I want to, and of course, we all heard the conservative right wing narrative about the cell phones, young men with the cell phones, etc., etc. Uh, mm, but, but I was wondering what roles do new media play possibly and uh, really? Uh, um, I just want to explain in the beginning that it's not a conservative uh, opinion. Uh, you cannot imagine. You cannot imagine how many times I heard these questions from a friend of mine. Yeah, from they're, they're conservative. Uh, yes, but if this was, you know, a group of people that uh, have this notion that we can, you know, call conservative and they are somewhere there, it would be easier. I was surprised that people who on a daily basis are, you know, cons consider the same, uh, themselves as progressive, leftists, because we are in, in Poland, yeah, like we are so separated from the issue. Like even those people were asking me about their cell phones, but I was... For the past three years, I've been like a lotus flower answering these questions. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can say anything that you don't know, because I think it's kind of obvious um, uh, how people use it. Um, it was, yeah, but even for me, it was a shock that the first thing that we would set up on the borders in Serbia and Greece were the uh, Wi-Fi you know, machines, so it could work. So it was even surprising for me. But of course it was crucial. Uh, whole uh, routes were discussed uh, online. Of course in 2015-16 it was a bit easier to travel. This I'm coming back to the topic of the route because I honestly cannot imagine how people did it before. These routes exist, but they were coming, you know, like with a group of friends, like two, three people by themselves. How possibly they managed to find their way through Europe? Like even with Google Maps, in the countries where they didn't know the language, they even didn't know the alphabet, if we talk about Balkans. 
So uh, of course now it was easier because people were going all together, but like they were, the all information was online translated. There were international networks. There were networks uh, for refugees created by themselves. They were very quickly exchanging information on where to go, how much it costs, where is the biggest danger. Uh, the, so it, of course it was the most important for them and contact with the families constantly. Uh, it, I think it's one of the most important elements, like the, that we were setting up these Wi-Fi spots, so hotspots, so they could actually let the family know that they survive, uh, especially the, the on the sea. Um, but uh, social media uh, was also really important for us as volunteers, because especially in the first month of 2000, uh, the last month of 2000, 2015, everything was organized through Facebook. And like I was always very uh, suspicious about social media. I would never. I think people, you know, overestimate the role of it, especially during the Arab Spring. But in this case, we literally managed to uh, communicate through social media. Uh, there were people traveling around Balkan route, and you know, really pointing on the map that was online, where the help was needed, where the volunteers were needed, what the kind of supplies were needed. There is also another thing that flows through social media, is the information about Polish xenophobia and racism. And you cannot imagine how ashamed I was when I was working on Macedon and Serbian border, and I had to explain people who saw on you know, their smartphones the anti-Islamophobic, anti-Islamization demonstrations in Poland. So also, uh, you know, social media it provides information, but it also, um, you know, people had really easy access to this kind of information, and they were seriously afraid of coming to Poland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I address this question to, to the artists, artists uh, gathered here, it will be a tricky question because almost none of you uh, works with people, uh, even even in the um, uh, in the world of uh, Katia and Oliver. We found the protagonist at the end. Uh, it's not her images; it's your recreation of her route. And we've got landscapes. We've got birds and architecture, uh, we've got walls and models, we, we've got an architecture of oppression uh, missing here. Uh, maybe anyone from uh, uh, the group of artists would like to uh, comment on the reasons uh, to tell the story of people uh, without showing them and the, and explain the choice of media through which, uh, to which you decided to tell the story. Um, yes, I deliberately didn't work with people because I met these people and uh, I could say um, I couldn't find a way, a part of the normal way of photojournalism which is like over exploited in, in the news, newspapers or internet. Uh, I couldn't find a way to transform it to art project. I'm not a photojournalist, I'm, I'm an artist and I simply... The only way I, I wanted to do it, I met Afghan, I mean, Afghan photographer in the camp and I was thinking to bring him over to Poland and give him a job, but that was impossible because I didn't have any posts at that time. That was the only kind of way I could think of transforming the relation to people, with, with, with people, to, to, to artistic project. It's very difficult to my mind to, to work with people. That's why all of us, or most of us, avoid people as a person. Because it's very personal, you know. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can add something. add something. Because we, I think in our work, there are at least 30 portraits. So yeah. and it's, uh, there's uh, some portraits of Edira we can see. There are also like old photographs Oliver's mother did of her. But we didn't only want to show her. And we show all the other people we met. And for us, it's like super important to show these people and to show like through our kind of relationship with Indira, we met all the other people and uh, 
that all our stories in a way are connected and through our travel and uh, that was for us maybe it would have been easier to um, just travel and just find our ways but on the other hand if you talk with people and for example we met some like other refugees or Bosnian people who now live in St. Louis and they tell, told us their stories and we met like uh, Often also incidentally because there was like in Bowling Green there was a young woman and all of us said she looks really interesting let's let's talk her, to her just just because and she was also coming from a Bosnian family so that's uh, for us it was like super super important and uh, but the people uh, the the people live in the landscapes and they are all connected to all the other things so it's a part of the work but it's an important part to talk to the people. Thank you. We have a question. Very lovely question. Um, hello. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this for your interesting um, symposium. And it's very more common because I um, I was kind of really surprised to see so many works that are still um, dealing with the uh, um, so-called quote have foster archival impulse, but also with the slow down, time based. Um, image that is when we um, think about tenden tendencies um, um, in the last years, curatorial strategies like um, post-internet aesthetic, virtual reality, and all these uh, things that came up when we also talk about the digital flow, um, that you as a creator also decided to step uh, um, yeah, back from all these hypes. And um, I find it very interesting because it maybe still shows how when we talk about um, yeah, photography and truth, or the agency of photography, that we still, um, that photography might still be a tool to, um, yeah, talk on topics, um, um, or to explain relations between text, archive, um, and image, that, um, yeah, you chose, like all these work, um, um, work that you chose um, deal with these relationships, and um, I find it almost still very convincing that it still works, so it's, it's more a comment and um, something I have to think about. And um, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for this moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we have to stop. <laughs> I think we all roasted now. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on Sunday yeah. morning. Uh, thank you to all the artists. Thank you, Inga. Thank you, Iris. Thanks for the organizers. Uh, thanks to the organizer for the discussion. Uh, see you. <laughs>